nurtured on violence and motivated by hate. This is the Third Reich. Gunther Ginte, behold. In trying so hard to destroy my soul, you may lose your own. If there's still one there to lose. These milestone television events all hold one remarkable feature in common. They were brought to international audiences by the imagination and commitment of one person. His name is David L. Walper. He produced them. As the man whose quality documentaries invigorated the public's interest in history, whose miniseries, movies, and live extravaganzas captured the imagination of millions, David Walper alone knows the human drama and comedy behind each production. He also knows the principle that guides him through them. I want to entertain and inform, not just inform and not just entertain. What follows is the odyssey of a man whose work spans a range of entertainment which by some estimates has been seen by more viewers than any one producers. This then is the story of a man captivated by history, a showman who makes things happen. I don't know if I deserve this honor or not, but I want it. David Wolper on the second hole. Mr. and Mrs. Robert Mondavi looking on in the background. When one spends 50 years in a career emerging at the top of the heap, tributes, toasts, and charity events are commonplace. In the entertainment business, however, the revered honoree invariably must face a humbling, ego-dashing ritual known as the roast, this one thrown by the American Film Institute. I have never in my life ever worked or made a buck from David Laus Walper. You know, I actually love David Walper. I've always admired him from some distance, which I insisted on. I would now like to introduce the man of the hour, David Walper! One usually doesn't step into the role of producer by birthright. One doesn't succeed as a producer, as Walper has, simply by luck, either. What brought him to the pinnacle of his profession, and what a producer actually does to earn that title, are the color-filled themes of the extraordinary story that follows. In 1928, David Lloyd Walper becomes the first and only child of Anna and Irving Walper. His father is a real estate agent, a perilous occupation during the Great Depression of the 30s. When he would make a big deal, we'd move to a better neighborhood, then it would start, the money would start going down and he hadn't made a deal, and when is he gonna make another one because we can't keep in the same building? So we moved to, back to a, a lesser neighborhood until he made another deal, so I kept moving around the city of New York. Two subjects, above all others, attract his attention during his high school years, sports, and history. I wasn't only interested in history, it was, I was also interested in show business. From 16 to 18 was actually was a waiter in the, in the Catskill Mountains. You know, you get to meet some comedians, some entertainers, so I naturally was drawn toward show business. By his late teens, Walper has little doubt the world of entertainment is his destiny. He enters the University of Southern California, pursuing both cinema and journalism. As business manager of the Campus Humor magazine, he and the editor, Art Buckwald, hit it off for a lifetime friendship. 
Delightful co-eds further distract him from his studies. When he receives an offer he can't refuse. Television in 1948 was just coming with 15 stations at the time and a friend of mine's father had some old films and couldn't get rid of them and said, why don't you kids try to sell them to television stations? Walper quits college to be in on the ground floor of the new medium. At 20, he finds himself a salesman for Flamingo Films. Crisscrossing the country countless times, he attends the openings of 85 new stations. The product he sells ranges from Flash Gordon serials to feature films from the 30s and early 40s. The steady diet of heavy traveling for several years, though profitable, is far from the glamorous side of show business Walper had expected. It got very lonely going out for six months. 21 years old and you, have no, you don't know anybody and you go to a town and have to eat dinner by yourself. Fortunately, hardworking buddies from his Catskill Hotel days are also on the road. Victor Moon and Joey Bishop, Alan King, Don Rickles. Wherever I got to a town where they were playing, I had a friend. In 1951, he makes his initial sale of an original series, and Flamingo introduces the Man of Steel to a national television audience. Ball perceives the production end of the business as the way to go, although opportunity doesn't knock until 1956. Ironically, current events, history, not fictional stories, trigger his producing career. His first commitment to it will result in national notoriety. I was walking down the street in New York and I met a man who was the Russian film representative from the Soviet Union, who I had met when I was distributing films. Mm -hmm. And he said, Do you, are you interested in buying any Russian space footage? And I said, you're kidding. I went immediately to look at the film. I bought it the next day. And that film mixed with American film was what I made my first documentary out. He calls it the race for space. Russia's space program has defied the notion of a superior American one. The hour special, which Walper speculates on with his own money, dramatically documents the intense race. Utilizing the services of young filmmakers, he also hires a relatively unknown TV journalist to host the film. The race for space is met with enthusiasm by a national sponsor, Old Spice. All Walper has to do now is get it on the air. But despite his years in the medium, he's totally unprepared for the response that greets him from the networks. Well, gee, got it sold, now all I do is go to the networks and they'll put it on, and found out that none of the three networks would put the show on the air at all. When I showed the film to NBC, they offered me a job at the network. Why, you know, it's just wonderful, I can't put it on air, but why don't you come to work for NBC and make documentaries here? I said, I don't want to make documentaries for NBC. I want to sell my diet. I got my 75,000, I'm going to get this out. Well, we can't put it on the air. They don't buy independently produced documentaries because um, they haven't got control of them. They don't know if they're honest or anything. Then the final blow came when he said, and besides, we don't want the man measuring the space race to be the same guy measuring the length of a parliament cigarette. That guy will never be on CBS. One of man's oldest dreams, a trip to the stars. No, no, no. There I had $75,000, a sponsor, and I couldn't get the show in here. His back against the wall, determined to get his program seen, Walper devises an unorthodox battle plan. It's based on relationships he'd built during his years as a salesman on the road. I got a hold of 150 friends at 150 separate television stations in this country. And they all agreed to put it on the air and that same week, and they all preempted some of the biggest network shows. I made my own network, what was called the Fourth Network. They believed in me. I, they, they wanted to bail me out of my $75,000. They didn't want me to lose my money. And because of the publicity of that, uh, a lot of people came to me to do other films, and that started my career. The Race for Space delivers huge ratings and marks the birth of an independent producer with whom the three networks must now have to reckon. These are Hollywood's golden years. The story of Hollywood. Walper realizes that while network news divisions remain an adversary, 
His idea of documenting the history of the movies may appeal to the entertainment programmers. He's right. And three one-hour specials are aired on NBC in the early 60s. For the first time, film clips and behind-the-scenes footage are melded to show and tell the vibrant story. Her private life is public, her public life is publicity. This is the price a symbol pays. And these are the sights and sounds in the life of Marilyn Monroe. While these specials are meant to entertain, they don't shy away from depicting the darker side of Hollywood's heritage. Freddy, this is what we would say with the conflict of careers. A sex symbol becomes a thing, said Marilyn Monroe. I just hate to be a thing. Almost overnight, Wolper finds himself hiring scores of documentarians. From his first building on Sunset Boulevard emerge historical and live action reality series. But the profit margin is slim for these syndicated half hour shows. He knows he needs to get more product shown on the networks to sustain his momentum. No one has yet made a TV special from a best selling nonfiction book. Wolper gambles that this is the one. This was 1962. Uh, I called up Irving Lazar, who represented it, and I said, I'd like to make a documentary. How much do you want for it? He said, it was $250,000, David. I said, $250,000? I only have $20,000 budgeted for the thing. He says, you've got a deal. He quickly acquires a sponsor. Confident his fourth network, if not one of the big three, will air it, he enters production. Setting out to make a 90-minute definitive history of the pivotal election of the century between Nixon and Kennedy, he persuades Theodore White, the book's Pulitzer Prize-winning author, to write the film. Since no one TV news source covered the entire electoral process in 1960, footage must be gathered from countless stations and newsreel companies to record the dynamic drama. I am sick and tired of hearing my opponent run down the President of the United States and his administration. He shows an ignorance economically which disqualifies him from even being considered as President of the United States. The Vice President of the United States says that he will go to Eastern Europe if he wins this election. I will go to Washington, D.C. And one day, we get to the end of the film. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Teddy says, how many words do I have to end this film? You say, Teddy, Kennedy is shaking hands with Eisenhower. And it takes about, well, about three words. Three words? I'm going to end a 90-minute story that 19, of the election of 1960? What the hell are you talking about? That's all the time we have. So off he goes. About an hour later, he said, I wrote the ending. I said, and he puts it on my desk. And I look at the thing. You son of a bitch. You are the greatest. You are the greatest. I couldn't believe it. I, I nearly was in tears. And here's what he wrote. Kennedy is shaking hands with, with Eisenhower. So power passes. Can't, can't beat those words. So power passes. <laughs> The producer is proud of his final product. It is not current hard news, so he expects the networks this time around to welcome a unique film. You can't put it on CBS. I can't put it on CBS. It was written by Teddy White, who's your political. They hired him as their political advisor. He's the guy who tells you what's right and wrong. What do you mean I can't put it on? We don't put the, uh, NBC. We don't put it on there. ABC, John Daly was the head of news there. No. I knew of somebody who knew Leonard Goldenson, the chairman of the board of ABC. He got the film to Leonard Goldenson personally, and he and his wife went home and saw the film that night and called John Daly and said, John, it's going on ABC. The winner in Hollywood is the making of the president, 1960. Accepting the award, the producers, David L. Walker and Mel Stewart. The award is for the best program of the year. 
1964, the most prized Emmy of all. The award that means most to me would be the first Emmy I ever won. I'd like to thank Emmy. Here I am, winning the television program of the year as an independent producer who had been rejected by the three networks. What a moment of glory. What a moment for me. By his early 30s, Walper achieves a goal that exceeds his wildest expectations. What can he do for an encore? Having produced the most acclaimed TV program of the year earns Wolper further admiration from both the press and the industry itself. With a flurry of new business coming his way, he moves to larger quarters on Sunset Boulevard. But he knows how fragile success is, that his next big step is what counts. He convinces the National Geographic Society he can adapt their magazine for television. Sensing the value of associating with prestigious institutions, he's then able to persuade CBS to commit to four primetime geographic specials during one season, a major coup in 1964. For the first time, the wonders of an exotic world and the work of those dedicated to exploring it are brought before a national audience. Perhaps the one that I like to think back on most was the first time that a wild chimpanzee mother came up to me and allowed her infant to reach out with that wondering expression in his eyes to touch me. And that, of course, was Flo with her infant, Flint. And that's another moment I'll never forget. In tandem with Time magazine for a topical series, Walper proposes for one episode a variation on the famous journalistic scoop. Henry Stanley, a reporter for the New York Herald, went to Africa in search of Dr. Livingston. Walper sends his reporter filmmaker to South America to attempt to track down Martin Bormann or Joseph Mengele, both top Nazis known to be in hiding there. I had come here because von Eckstein had told me that Mengele was a representative of the Cafete Company, one of El Dorado's leading businesses. The Cafete Company is owned in part by Joseph Mengele's brother, Alois. Behind the factory is a guest house, surrounded by a wall topped by broken glass that can be entered only through the Cafete property. Reporting of a different kind is done under the aegis of another reputable partner. In this first network special on the legends of Bigfoot and other monsters believed still to be among us, the pros and cons are graphically presented. A privately funded expedition hopes to photograph a live Bigfoot. They're prepared to penetrate the darkness of night with special light amplification viewing devices. Monster hunters must always be on guard against the hoaxer. The public fascination with this subject stuns the statisticians. The program remains, after a quarter century, the highest rated documentary in television history. We all have our successes and failures. I've had failures along the way too. In fact, I will confess to selling out. I did a picture, Do Blondes Have More Fun for Clairol? Talking about blondes is almost as much fun as watching them, but not quite. And I must say, 
It was not a successful picture. It was not a good idea. I'm sorry I make it. And we go on with life. A network audience responds favorably to George Plimpton, a well-known journalist who puts himself on the line in professions many viewers fantasize about. Excuse me, George Plimpton. I'm oh, joining yes. your company, I believe, is the second heavy. Oh, no, no. Duke, George Plimpton. Hello, how are you? How are you? you? He's going to play Paper for Tiger? Paper Lion. Paper Lion, <laughs> yeah. I want to get a lesson on the on the proper walk, Duke. Uh, well, uh, the walk's been kind of a, a secret in our family for a long time. My dad taught me, but I can't keep it forever. Uh, I'll tell you how he showed me. There is a trick me. to it, is it? Yeah, he says, you pick up one foot, put it forward and set it down, then you pick up the other foot. <laughs> Set it down, and that's walking forward. If you do the reverse, you're walking back. <laughs> but to look like you're in complete control, the best thing is to have your, uh, to be walking on the flat of your foot or the balls yeah. of your feet. Yeah, yeah. That's all I can give you. Well, that's a good lesson. Okay. <laughs> can he aim the gun at these men here? You better. The Plimpton series of specials benefits by the success Walper has already achieved in creating the personality-driven documentary. Several years earlier, a middle-aged French underwater explorer and environmentalist had been featured in one of Walper's first National Geographic specials. Walper believed the man had star quality and that the mysteries of the deep played well on television. He flies to Monaco to meet Jacques Cousteau and establish a relationship. He hopes he can sell one or perhaps four specials featuring the adventurous mariner. They both agree his ship needs modernizing, his crew sprucing up, if an American audience is going to warm to their voyages. We talked about the, the wetsuits. I said, they're so boring, you can't see them underwater. He said, I got a good idea, I'll put a yellow stripe on this suit. I said, terrific. But then Cousteau presents an ultimatum Walper is sure will sink any deal he could try to make in New York. Yeah, David, I can't do it. I just figured the money. You have to do 12 hours. I said, gee, I don't know if I got 12, 12 hours to one time. Jack, can I do it over four years? I said, no, you got to sell the 12 hours. I need the money to fix the ship up and to do what you want. I go to NBC, they don't even know Jack Cousteau. Is. Who is he? Well, he's the undersea guy, invented the Aquaman. We don't care. I go to CBS back to Silverman. He says, I love it, but I can't take more than six. Whoop. I mean, four, is, I, I'll be killed if I take one network to go. Expecting rejection again, Walper makes his final pitch to Tom Moore of ABC. He says, David, you know, I'm a member of the Explorers Club, and I have the task this year of getting a speaker. You get Jacques Cousteau to show up on July 6th at that show, I'll put the 12 shows on the air for you. I ran back to the hotel. It was 3 o'clock in the morning in, in Monaco. I wake up Cousteau. I say, Jacques, we're on the air, but you've got to give a speech and so he says, I'll be there, David. So Custo became a star and the rest is history. We have begun our search for the shark. We do not know where he will come from, nor what attracts him most. Indeed, if not for pure luck in the form of the meeting's perfect timing, one of the century's most influential charismatic figures might never have become known beyond his homeland. Not unusual. Cousteau and Walper remain in close touch for three decades. In 1995, he receives a holiday note from Cousteau that today is among his most cherished mementos. Dear David, I will never forget what you did to start my career. This note is to wish you everything for your happy year. I would love to see you again, but when? Unfortunately, I never saw him again. He died shortly thereafter.
After more than a decade of producing scores of award-winning documentaries such as D-Day, Walper finds he has all but exhausted the newsreel archives from which he drew the historical footage. A bold stroke is needed to keep reality programming alive on network television. In a tombstone street, these men march toward a moment of truth. Now, their hate will explode in the West's most celebrated gunfight. Appointment with destiny. With this series of specials, a new term enters the vernacular, docudrama. Let's do our own stock footage. We know how they do it. Let's take a subject and shoot it as though somebody shot footage when they were there. Interview people, do it just like we do the documentary. This, however, is the first time that Stauffenberg has ever met Hitler. His wife, Nina, tells us of Stauffenberg's reactions. For the first time, he began to see Hitler's power over people. That's why he made up his mind that he would kill Hitler. The technique of mixing actual newsreel footage with recreations will become the source of heated controversy once this film airs. This, of course, is the real Hitler. This scene, needed to develop the general's conspiracy, simulates newsreel coverage utilizing actors. No footage was found of Hitler's meeting at Wolf's Lair in July 1944, when a bomb was planted by his feet. Nor was his miraculous survival of the explosion photographed. These scenes are all recreations. John O'Connor, television reporter from the New York Times, objected to the thing seriously. He said, you're taking all this footage, we're going to believe it's the real thing. I said, John, we're doing something on Christ. We know we didn't have film on Christ. Give me a break, you know. He said, well, it's all too real. I can't tell the real Hitler from the other Hitler. And, you know, that's dangerous. It was so well executed by my staff, and we won an award for the whole point with necessary for creating a new technique of doing it. Now, he might have been right. I saw a film done on Hitler two years ago in which the fake footage, somebody stole it from our film. They thought it was the real Hitler. I put it in their documentary. In 1970, Walper takes the plunge into the theatrical film world with a feature-length documentary, The Hellstrom Chronicle. Comfortable with the non-fiction material, he believes bugs on the big screen will appear monstrous, and backed by the terrifying premise they will inherit the Earth, will attract a paying audience. Utilizing the latest photographic techniques, the film is a compelling, mesmerizing look at rarely seen, sometimes unsettling nature. In the innocent disguise of grasshoppers, they will wait endless years until something in the air signals the time is right. Massing together, their bodies begin to change. Like Jekyll into Hyde, great jaws and wings burgeoning outward as they begin their monstrous flight into hell. Too late, they are recognized as the locusts. Walper appreciates the value of publicity for attracting paying customers into theaters. He enters the film in the Cannes Festival, where it wins a grand jury prize. For American audiences, however, the award won't mean too much, and he revives a sales ploy practiced by a master showman. A film distributor that I had known by the name of Joe Levine, who became a famous producer, once told me about a trick, and I pulled that trick that day. I waited till everybody left. I went up to the box office when it was just about to close, and I say, how much money have you taken in so far? She said, well, we have a little under $5,000. Well, I knew what the house record was. I said, give me $200 worth of tickets. And she sold me $200 worth of tickets, and my $200 purchase brought us over the house record. So the next day I was able to advertise, Hellstrom Chronicle breaks first day house record in Crest Theater. Walper's speculation pays off at the box office. 
and is capped by an Oscar for Best Documentary Feature of the Year. But as he well knows, his efforts alone didn't earn him the precious statuette. Good producers make dreams come true. They make things happen, but you gotta get good people. I had a, the ability, thank God, to pick people who know what the hell they're doing and could deliver what my vision would be or what combined with their vision. In 1972, selected to make the official documentary of the Munich Olympics, Walper wants eight famous feature film directors each to interpret an aspect of the games. But first he has to convince them to leave big budget features to work with small crews and no script. First person I went to was Federico Fellini. I told him about it. He said, I'm gonna do something even better than doing the picks for you. I'm gonna let you tell everybody in the world that I am doing the picture. I can't because I got another film to do. And then at the end, when you got all the other directors, Fellini will drop out and you will have all your directors. I said, Mr. Fellini knew exactly why I was here. I thank you very much. And I was able to get many of the great from Milos Foreman, Arthur Penn, John Schlesinger, and so on. Swedish director Mai Zetterling chooses to explore the efforts of men who have dedicated their lives to one of the most fascinating competitions in the Olympics. Weightlifting. taking of Israeli athletes by PLO commandos brings all activities to a halt. Once the shocking massacre is ended and despite the pall cast by the tragedy, the decision is made that these games must continue. Walper's film also will be completed. It is the first time he's present during a major historical incident, but it won't be the last. And his love affair with the Olympics has just begun. In 1968, less than 10 years after making his low-budget documentary, The Race for Space, a major studio commissions Walper to produce a multi-million dollar feature, The Devil's Brigade. He must adjust from dealing with a handful of creative and technical personnel under his command to more than 100, besides the movie stars. The transition goes smoothly on this action film, based on a true story. But a year later, on his second World War II film, The Bridge at Remagen, much will go wrong. A bridge outside of Prague is chosen to double for the one in Germany, which the first American troops crossed before it collapsed. The new Czech government, having shed its Iron Curtain image, welcomes the American company, although Mother Russia isn't pleased. Somebody in the crew brings me an article in the newspaper that says, the Russians are claiming that I was a CIA agent and that a whole crew and everything were all CIA agents trying to bring arms into Czechoslovakia. So I went to the authorities. I said, look at this thing. You know, this is dangerous. They're accusing me of being a CIA agent. 
We'll take care of it. It's just nothing. Absolutely. It's just foolishness. We'll take care of it. Three days later, the Russians invade Czechoslovakia. As at the Munich Olympics, a savage current event intrudes on a Walper production. With only two weeks filming left, the American cast and crew are forced to flee. A Czech and Russian general meet with Walper in Vienna to assure quick removal of the American tanks left behind. The Russians are concerned they might be used by resistance forces. Within days, the rented tanks are returned by train to Austria. The movie is completed in Italy and Germany, but Walper decides to forego any more difficult war films for a while. The break with reality he seeks comes from an unlikely quarter. A non-show business company approaches Walper looking for a family film it will happily finance. Quaker Oaks was a sponsor of mine on television, and they were going to come out with a candy bar, and they asked me if I have any thoughts of promoting it. Maybe we'll do a film. Well, somebody who worked for my company, Mel Stewart, son had mentioned a book called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So I mentioned, well, how about the book Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? It's all about a chocolate factory. They came up with the idea of let's maybe naming the candy bar Wonka, which was the name of the bar in the book, change the title of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, release the picture at the same time that the candy bar came out. So they'd have all that promotion. Well, the picture was released, the candy bar was on the stand, and what happened? The candy bar melted in the rapid. Something happened to the formula, and the candy bar turned out to be a failure, and Willy Wonka turned out to be a cult picture. I think there were maybe were 12 candy bars sold in all the time and five and a half million video cassettes on Willy Wonka. So the picture made it, but the candy bar failed. By the early 70s, movies made especially for television become a popular format. Walper Productions is on the ground floor, represented by its forte, social, historical, and reality subject matter. Through the years, Walper oversees some 30 movies of the week. And while no production is without its stressful moments, this one proves to be his most daunting, yet gratifying. Betty Ford's story was one of my toughest films to make. Something wrong? Dr. Cruz and I think that you're taking too many pills and drinking too much. You what? In order to tell the ex-First Lady's wrenching story of her addictions with total authenticity, he invites her to become as involved with the film as she wishes. It's all right to write about being an alcoholic in a book, but when you see it on the screen portrayed by Jenna Rollins, and we're sitting in a screening room with Mrs. Ford there, and she's looking at that, and that's her, it really got to her. She could hardly stand looking at it. What I do in my house... It's my own business. And I don't care what you, I don't care what Dr. Cruz, I don't care what anybody has to say about it. Do you understand me? You get out of my house. You get out of my house Mom, now. please don't. Get out. Get out of here. Get out. In spite of the toughest film I've ever made, in spite of her driving me crazy and just, you know, driving me mad with every detail, She's one of the most fabulous women I've ever met. She deserves to be one of the most popular women in the world because she's really a great woman. As icing on the cake for the ultra-true biography, Jenna Rollins wins an Emmy for her strong, nuanced performance. In 1973, after being introduced to James Comack, a veteran comedy writer, actor, and producer, Walper decides to try to master a totally new arena the sitcom. The two join forces, and against all odds, come up with back-to-back -back winners. Chico and the Man, the first one, introduces a new talent, Freddie Prince. While from the second one, Welcome Back Cotter, a supporting player emerges as a star. Revive those smelling salts. To revive, hold two to three inches on the victim's nostrils. Oh, what a 
a smell. <laughs> John Travolta's popularity propels him into two hit movies made between seasons. But his good fortune can well mean big trouble to Walper. If Travolta leaves the show, the Walper Company, earning its first big profits since starting, could lose the series. So I knew there's going to be trouble. I mean, I'm going to hear from somebody. Some agent's going to call me and say, the contract doesn't say this. I'm just going to try to get out of the thing. Not what happened. I get a call from John Travolta. He walks into my office, and he says, Mr. Walper, and he called me Mr. Walper. I've just done two pictures, and I've, going to, I can, and I've been offered an enormous amount of money for some other pictures. He said, but I've committed to do a series for you. He said, what I will do, I'd like to make a suggestion. He said, I will do the episodes for you. I will give you six weeks of my life. Do as much as you can in $1,000 a show. If you get all the shows in, I'll do them all. I'll work day and night to get them in for you. Just give me all the rest of the time off, and I'll do the show for you. I reached across the desk, shook his hand, said, you got a deal, John. I appreciate you coming and not sending an agent to give me a lot of bullshit. And that's what we did, and we went for two more years. What I liked about it is he walked in and did that. I never forgot him for that. But that was a gentleman. By the early 70s, Walper, not yet 50 years old, with documentaries, feature films, movies for television, and sitcoms all under his belt, might seem to have done it all. But soon he will embark on a project that will alter the course of television history. The networks now gladly answer Walper's phone calls from his ever-expanding headquarters. At the same time, the pressure is on him to come up with ever more original and commercial material. Such an opportunity does come his way by chance, and he seizes the moment. I was having dinner with two friends of mine, Ruby D. and Ozzie Davis, and they told me that a friend of theirs was writing a book about seven generations of his family that he attracted the actual story, he attracted them back to Africa and found his original village that he came from. And I said, that's a terrific idea. How do I meet the person? I got to meet Alex Haley. He's one of the great storytellers. I had him tell the story to the American Broadcasting Company. And once they heard it, they said, let's make a miniseries out of it. Originally, it was going to be six hours. It turned into 12 hours for the first time. By retracing Alex Haley's heritage back to its known origins, Roots must document the white man's ugly secret. Until now, an in-depth depiction of slavery had never been attempted on television. You never saw somebody from Africa being picked, taken away from his mother, his grandmother, and his father, and brought to the United States. So when that person was a slave in the United States, you knew that was a person. One of the early scenes of the picture is the slave ship. Now, you have to remember, African Americans living here in the United States today are playing the parts. And we have to pile them in a slave ship in chains, row on row on row of each other. Some of these actors cried. It was such an emotional experience for them. They just could hardly stand acting in the piece. One actor, Richard Roundtree, playing a slave named Sam, finds one particular scene of humiliation too difficult to cope with. He had to come out, and one of the scenes he had to get on his knees and beg his owner for something. 
He, he tried. He said, I can't do it. I can't get on my knees. I mean, he's such a proud man. He just couldn't do it. He went back to the trailer, and the director had to go back and say, you know, it's, it's an important scene. You know it's important to the picture. How dare you abuse my good nature? I told you to get that carriage home before dark. I'm sorry, master. I'm powerful sorry, but you see what I, I have was... a good mind to send you back into the fields. No, master. Give you a taste of some real work. No, master. Please then maybe you'll appreciate the good life I'm you've been leading. I'm sorry, leading. master. I'm sorry, master. I just might not buy you that no, much. No, 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 master. Please, please don't do that. Please. Bend down, master. these horses. Master, please. They're all lathered up. Bend them down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, master. I'm sorry, Master. How awful sorry, Master. Please. I'll deal with you in the morning. Bless you, Master. Bless you. What an experience with him to get on his knees in that scene. Took every bit of energy he had in his body. <laughs> While executive producer Walper, his producer Stan Margulies, the cast, and the network all know Haley's epic tale is something special. They also know its prospect for a big rating flies in the face of reality. 90% of America is white and 10% of America was black at the time. It does not sound like a good idea where the heroes are black and the villains are white and with that breakdown. But what it was, it was a great family story. You really rooted for that family. Roots becomes a national bestseller before the miniseries production is finished. While the book's readership is vast, it doesn't necessarily mean a big television audience will tune in. To the astonishment of all, the popularity of this drama is unprecedented. It receives a 71 share by the final episode. This astronomic figure translates into a simple equation. Roots has received the largest viewership of any program in the history of television. A deluge of Emmy Awards crowns Walper's achievement. But his greatest success so far also has extracted a heavy price. It was a tough, tough job. I had, I had a heart attack, I had a bypass operation. And I decided, you know, wait a second, I'm killing myself here. Maybe I should do, go in another direction. At 49, after much soul searching, he's run his own hands-on company nearly 20 years, he wonders if he can adjust to working any other way. He decides he must. He accepts the substantial buyout and contract that Warner Brothers offers him. He'll be able to practice the creative autonomy he's always had. The marriage proves to be an enduring one, almost a quarter of a century. Not surprisingly, his first production for Warner's is the miniseries sequel to Roots. James Earl Jones, portrays Alex Haley at the time he is an interviewer for Playboy magazine. His subject will be played by a movie star making his TV debut, both to the delight and apprehension of Walper. I got a call from Marlon Brando. He said, I loved Roots. I hear you're doing another thing. Is there a part for me? I said, uh, Marlon, I can't afford you. He said, whatever's put in that column, that's what I'll take. But I want to play a villain. I said, Marlon, I got the villain of villains. How about George Lincoln Rockwell, the president, the head of the Nazi party? He said, perfect. What's the money? I said, it's 10,000 for the day. He said, call my agent. I'll call him and tell him it's OK. So I call the agent, says 10,000 for the day. The agent said, but remember, it's over. We have to get another 10,000. OK, it's a lot of money. So now, Brando comes to the set, and I'm there. I greet him. And Marlon and I said, Walter, I know you're, you're never on this set. I've asked people, you're here because you want to see I finish in a day, aren't you? <laughs> well, not really. Come on. You go back to your office. What time is you, you finish your number? You say, well, about 6. He says, at quarter to 6, I'll call you. You can come by and say goodbye to me because we'll be all finished. I have been called nigger many times, and uh, this is the first time that I'm being paid for it. So you just go right ahead. Now, what have you got against us niggers? Oh, I've got nothing against you. You're... An intelligent person. I, I enjoy talking to you. But then, uh, you're not uh, pure black. Uh, there must have been some uh, white man in your background. Am I right? Right. 
What I'm saying is that uh, your intelligence comes from my race. Uh, it comes from the blood of my people, and uh, white blood can make a, a part nigger uh, intelligent. At quarter to six, Marlon was on the phone. David, we're finished. You can come over. <laughs> and the winner is Roots, the next generation. Second only to Roots in all-time viewing statistics, the next generations likewise sweeps the Emmys in 1979. Alex Haley, the creator of Roots, dies in 1992 at the age of 70. When I met Alex, he wasn't famous. Roots came out, and of course, he becomes one of the most famous men in the world. Let me say that Alex Haley didn't change this much from the day I met him to all his fame. He took his fame as gently and as wonderful as anybody I've ever met. He was a great man, he had a great heart, and he had a great feeling for people. Now looking for a television project that might come close to Root's success, Walper inquires of Warner co-chairman Robert Daly if the feature film division might have a property it's been unable to adapt for a motion picture. There is. Well, I was so excited, I said, the Thornbirds, I'll take it. The bestseller has so far confounded a number of leading writers and directors. None can figure how to translate its theme to the big screen. Walper relishes the challenge of making it work on the small screen. The great story of the Thornbirds is the priest holding out and this woman. He wanted that woman and she wanted him, but they never consummate a love scene. Now in a movie, it's two and a half hours. So they meet each other and two and a half hours later, they're in bed. It looks kind of sleazy. In my show, they meet and they go and they meet again and they make love and he leaves again and they come back and he leaves again and they come back. And finally, after eight hours of film, they consummate the love. It took some time and that's why the Thornbirds made a great miniseries, but they could never come up with a terrific script for the theaters. The Thornbirds is met with huge ratings and numerous awards. Before Roots and the Thornbirds, Walper's peers referred to him as Mr. Documentary. But by now, and certainly after he produces North and South, his record-setting 24-hour Civil War drama, he is known as Mr. Miniseries. Remarkably, during these active years, Walper finds time to undertake two major international live events which will leave an indelible impression on a worldwide audience. Once Los Angeles is selected as the site of the 1984 Olympics, a major force behind its success will be the person selected to produce the opening and closing ceremonies. The opening is especially important. It can set the tone for the spirit of the next two weeks' events. Nearly a year of the producer's time will be devoted to the mammoth assignment. Walper's asked to take it on. He accepts. The first live giant spectacle in his career, it is cause for some anxiety. What I was nervous about is what the press around the world would say about the United States or what they would say about Hollywood. I could just see it saying, Hollywood, the center capital of the world of entertainment, does a lousy opening ceremony. 
And I, that, that, that's the thing that, that was the tension on me. For my country and for my own community, it was very important that I be successful. Creating the ideas for show-stopping imagery is the major part of the job. Execution of them is, of course, no less vital. Recruiting nearly 8,000 entertainers for the two spectacles isn't a cinch either. But the clockwork precision of their work, their entrances and exits, is assured by the veteran event director, Tommy Walker. All is going well when suddenly Walper must confront the shades of Munich. The stands are full, everybody's ready to go. I'm all nervous. The door opens and Ed Best, the head of security, comes in and tells me, I think there's a bomb in the toys. I said, oh my God. I look over and I see the bomb squad. The people can't see it. And they're going in and looking at the thing. And I said, oh my, geez. And I don't tell anybody. On we go with the show. Every once in a while I think about it, and I push my button and I ask, how are we doing with anything happening with the bomb? And I don't hear. Lift up your car. <laughs> Finally, Ed Best comes back to the thing. What was it? Well, ABC had decided they wanted another camera. They couldn't get into the tower, so they broke the lock, and went into the tower, they had left some boxes there, and there were some wires that were going into boxes from the ABC camera, and that was the scare. All it was was ABC, and that was a great relief. The ceremony proceeds without further incident. An estimated billion people are watching around the world. Walper has also been instrumental in making the TV sales, which provide a huge profit for the Olympic Committee. As the 100,000 in the stadium look on in awe, Rafer Johnson, Olympic decathlon winner in 1960, carries the torch to its final destination. Always one of the most moving, visually thrilling moments of an Olympics opening, on this day it crowns a spectacle that sets new standards for host cities that will follow. The closing ceremony comes two weeks later. The athletic events have held the public in thrall under clear blue skies. Traffic jams to and from venues never materialized. It has been a joyous time, which Walper wants to cap with a Hollywood-style surprise. In the closing ceremonies, we decided we're gonna have a spaceship that's gonna fly in over the stadium and signal and talk to the stadium itself and land behind the Coliseum wall. We decided to keep it a secret of how we did it. What we did is I had a giant army helicopter with a steel thing that went about 200 yards above the spaceship. It was all wired with lights and controls. There was no lights on the army helicopter. It was completely dark. So all you saw was a spaceship. But you hear the noise of the helicopter. So I said, wait a minute, they're gonna hear the noise. So we had two helicopters like they were escorting the spaceship over the stadium. Nobody could figure out how we did it. He has been chosen to receive the prestigious Gene Herschel Humanitarian Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David L. Wolper. In one of those rare moments in show business that is truly glamorous, the Motion Picture Academy acknowledges David Wolper's contribution to his community. This Oscar is not given each year, which makes it even more special.
but it also makes him the leading candidate for another major international event. In 1986, both France and America want to celebrate the 100th birthday of the Statue of Liberty. I just had a second bypass operation when, I, when Iacocca called to have me come to New York. The renovation of both the statue and Ellis Island are underway when Walper is asked to produce Liberty Weekend. My grandparents had come through Ellis Island and seen the Statue of Liberty. And I thought, you know, I, I just couldn't resist it. There's something, I wanted to say no to the man, and I thought about it and I said, yes, I'll do it. He moves to New York to coordinate the 400 paid professionals and 700 volunteers like himself. They have less than a year to put together a July 4th weekend to remember. The New Yorkers were a little upset that a Hollywood producer was producing their weekend. It was a very hostile press. I considered the United States weekend, and I, and I produced it for that. When they say New York is tough, they really mean it. I mean, I had problems with the politicians. I had problems with the unions. I had problems with the police. I had problems with everybody in that city. Everything was payoff. And it got so impossible. Hello. So the first time in my life, halfway through, I told my wife, I came home, and I said, I'm quitting, let's go home. Let them put the goddamn thing on themselves. I just, I just have had it. Well, I had dinner that night, went to sleep, and the next morning I felt a little better and continued on and, and, and did Liberty Weekend. But it was the toughest experience of my life. Brushing aside his justifiable anguish, he forges ahead, heart therapist Nancy Tankle at his side, to see the most ambitious, complex, exhausting effort of his career to a successful conclusion. Good producers make things happen. He's gotta be a psychiatrist when he deals with people. He's gotta be a businessman when he's watching the money. He has to be a father figure so everybody feels comfortable. I have a feeling it's too plain. Too plain. But one thing he has to do, he's gotta have persistence. He's gotta stick with it and know what he's doing. Whatever it is, it should not be fake. It should be real and it should be leather. Okay, let's try it. Governor's Island, off the tip of Manhattan. The most crucial event of the weekend, the statue's rededication, is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, the program will begin in one hour. In one hour. You bring these things up, it is that. Nice to see you. After a year's effort, Walper still is focused completely on seeing to it that this ceremony runs perfectly. It is his moment of truth. Ladies and gentlemen, from Governor's Island in New York Harbor, to all the people of the world, welcome to the opening ceremonies of Liberty Weekend. We will unveil that gallant lady. Thank you, and God bless you all. Nancy. Weather-wise, it's one of the most perfect holiday weekends on record. On the evening of the 4th, from the comfort of a yacht, Walber begins to enjoy the fruits of his year's labor, along with stars who are donating their talents to the free events. Why, there's David Walber. Yes, he is. <clears throat> Just making a few arrangements. You are. There we go, get ready. July 4th, the largest fireworks display in America's history awes millions on Friday night. On Saturday night, 
a record 800,000 attend a star-studded concert in Central Park. Liberty Weekend's climactic show on Sunday, with millions watching around the world, is a super spectacle. The New York press may still hold a grudge against an out-of-towners producing Liberty Weekend, but New Yorkers themselves show no reservation in expressing their pleasure with his work. Of course, the press will soon come to praise him also. The government of France concurs with this assessment of Liberty Weekend and presents him with its highest civilian award, the Legion of Honor. With his live event days behind him, he returns to Hollywood where the unforeseen awaits him. In 1989, Walper is inducted into an exclusive club, the Television Academy's Hall of Fame. He is 61 years old, younger than many of his peers. He is still far from retired, but the honor is no less momentous. Despite his high-profile identification throughout the 80s and 90s with television miniseries, he also makes feature films for Warners. The first is a docudrama on Elvis Presley. A friend of mine who used to work for me, Andrew Salt, had the rights to do a film on Elvis Presley. And he came to me and said, could you help me put it together and work on the project with me? So I said, well, you know, I'm a Frank Sinatra fan, I'm a rock and roll, I'm, you know. So I went home and I mentioned it to my wife. He said, what? I'm the greatest Elvis fan and you don't want to do this film? Well, you've got to do it. You'll see the film. I want to see all the footage. I want to have all the fun. So I said, okay, I'll do the film. We'd like to do the, the song that was my very biggest record last year. I mean, it was no bigger than the rest of them, but... <laughs> I can be found Sitting home all alone If you can come around At least please telephone Well, baby, for me to your man I too became an Elvis fan. I heard the music, I realized he was a hell of a good singer. Didn't beat Sinatra with me, but he was pretty damn good. Another feature project he doesn't originate is virtually thrown into his lap when Yoko Ono calls, offering him access to the vast personal film library of her late husband. I said, well, I gotta be honest with you. I mean, I wasn't a fan of the Beatles or John Lennon. She says, that's perfect, but I'm not hiring for that. You're a documentary filmmaker. I know about your documentary. That's what I'm interested in, make a great documentary. So I said, well, let's go ahead and do it. And one thing I told her, I said, if, I, if we make this show, no interference. The show that comes out is the show that comes out. And she never interfered. Fortunately, I met you at the right time. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's right. <laughs> As 
sooner or later you begin to realize what made him great. And I never listened to it, I never bothered to listen to it. But when I listened to the music and I heard it over and over again, I began to appreciate what John Lennon was all about. And he wrote some great music. Surviving Picasso is one of several features he is personally anxious to make, but which takes years to get before the camera. A Picasso fan and collector, his persistence finally pays off when the creative team of Ishmael Merchant and James Ivory makes the film with him. Unfortunately, audiences stay away in droves. When I make pictures, I like people to see it. You put all your heart and your work into a film. So when a lot of people don't see it, you get disappointed. I succeeded in making a, a terrific picture, I believe, and I failed in, in getting an audience to see it. So it's, you know, it's half a success, half a failure. L.A. Confidential is another feature Walper spends years fostering. The fate which befalls this project further points up the unpredictability of show business. While Warners likes the script, they feel film noir isn't commercial these days and pass on it. Walper then convinces Arnon Milshan, head of Regency, an independent film company, to finance it. Together they produce the most critically acclaimed film of the year and winner of several Oscars. Once again, the value of Walper's credo, persistence, pays off. As the year 2000 approaches, after 50 years in the business, a touch of irony. Walper returns to his roots by producing two 10-hour documentary series which set out to record the entire 20th century. Through all the ups and downs of a colorful career and encounters with heart surgery, he also leads a full, if turbulent, private life. Three marriages, the second one to Dawn Richards, producing three children, Mark, Michael, and Leslie, and the third to Gloria Hill, with whom he shares the past 30 years. His son, Michael, is a business executive, while his daughter, Leslie, is a teacher. Of all his progeny, only Mark follows his father's path as a successful film and television producer. In terms of the history of show business, Walper's legacy is distinctive from all other producers in its variety, scope, and quality. If it still remains a puzzle for some what a producer actually does, besides putting his name before a title, my definition of producer is the man with the dream. In other words, I can't write, I can't sing, I can't write music, I can't, I'm not a photographer, I'm not an actor, I'm none of these things. I'm the guy who conducts the orchestra. I can't play any of the instruments in the orchestra, but I can conduct it. So a producer is the man with the dream, he has the idea to do it, he brings all the great talents together, and when he puts them all together, they all blend. And if they blend terrifically, I've done my job. As the century ends, he bequeaths his papers and archival material to the University of Southern California, creating the Walper Center for Documentary Studies. His 50-year journey from this campus to the international stage has been a truly unique one. From his modest beginnings as a film salesman, then on to becoming producer of documentaries and eventually the force behind the most watched television programs of all time, David Walper has lived out his dream. An independent spirit, a joy in risk-taking, and an unmatched degree of persistence are qualities that brought him his success. A body of work which has left a mark on both the world of entertainment and perhaps history itself. Thank you.